Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Al Roberts, and I'm a professor of world arts and cultures here at UCLA. This morning's exciting program on spirituality and diaspora, a conversation between Barbara Martinez Ruiz and Jose Bedia, is an outgrowth of an interdisciplinary graduate seminar led by information studies and Getty conservation specialist, Professor Ellen Perlstein. And it took place this past winter, and uh, this particular event today is sponsored by the Fowler Museum, the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, the UCLA Getty Conservation Program, UCLA Information Studies, and the James S. Coleman African Studies Center. I've been asked to step in as moderator for my great friend, Dr. Manuel Jordan, who has not been able to join us as we had all hoped. As you may know, Dr. Hodun has undertaken landmark research, writing, and exhibitions based upon many years of art historical research in northwestern Zambia. And he's a noted museum professional, now deputy director of the Musical Instrument Museum of Phoenix, or Finicky, as he calls Phoenix. Here's hoping that we can bring Manuel to UCLA sometime soon. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Dr. Barbaro Martinez Ruiz is the Tanner Operman Chair of African Art History in honor of Roy Sieber at Indiana University. He's also a research associate at the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Oxford in the UK. And recently, he's been a W.E.B. Du Bois uh, Fellow at the Hutchins Center for African American and African Research at Harvard. Dr. Martinez Ruiz holds an art history PhD from Yale, where he worked with Robert Ferris Thompson. He has deep expertise in African and Caribbean artistic, visual, and religious practices, and through long feet on the ground research among Congo communities of Northern Angola and adjacent countries, his work challenges traditional disciplinary boundaries to examine the varied understandings and engagement with art and visual culture. Dr. Martinez Ruiz's books include Congo uh, Graphic Writing and Other Narratives of the Sign, published in Spanish in 2012 and in English in 2013. Faisal Abdul Allah on the Art of Dislocation in 2012, and Art and Emancipation in Jamaica, Isaac Mendez Belisario and His Worlds in 2007 for which he received the College Art Association's Alfred H. Barr Award for Outstanding Museum Scholarship. On top of all that, Dr. Martinez Ruiz is a visual and installation artist. I'm equally honored to introduce our second speaker, Jose Bedia. Senor Bedia is a Cuban artist whose career has spanned over four decades. He's been a pioneer in the radical transformation of Cuban art as inaugurated through his integral part of participation in the 1981 exhibition Volumen Uno in Havana. In 2011, a writer for Cuban Art News recalled this signal event as the big bang of contemporary Cuban art. So big things got cooking from there on. From Senor uh, Bedia's participation in the monumental exhibition Magicien de la Terre in 1989 to winning first prize at the Beijing Biennale in 2010, his career has had long international reach. He merges his cultural and ethnographic interests through a fieldwork approach, and he adds layered social historical elements of many world traditions to his own artistry. Many of us here in Los Angeles will remember the UCLA Fowler Museum's breathtaking retrospective called Transcultural Pilgrim, Three Decades of Work by Jose Vidya, as guest curated by Judith Bettelheim and Janet Berlow in 2011. The artist's spiritual genealogy was explored through Senor Vidya's Cuban-based religion and its Central African sources and his immense site-specific painting an installation in a Fowler gallery called Figure Who Defines His Own Horizon Line stands in many eyes, including mine, as one of the Fowler's greatest triumphs of this century's second decade. Our guests will present aspects of their work and then time permitting, they may respond to questions you may ask, uh, you may wish to ask them uh, via the chat. So without further ado, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Martinez Ruiz to kick off our program this morning. 
Hello. Uh, thank you all um, for this generous uh, introduction. I, I, I don't know what to, <laughs> what to say when you hear something like that. And also, I, I would like to, to um, thank um, Ellen and yourself, uh, Marla and Deidre for uh, help uh, to put together uh, for, for the invitation. So uh, it's a great honor. And also, I would like to, as I try to do when I give a lecture, I, I would like to dedicate this this lecture to Robert Farris Thompson. I think it's the, I, I will try as many every time uh, just to dedicate it to him. And the 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 reason I I, I think is what I try to present today had to do more with uh, what is what is missing or how I come into into know. Um, Congo traditions and and why it's so important to me, and the 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 reason is the specific in the field of art history, or, or uh, African art history, and the study of a Congo culture. Uh, there is a, a long long claims about the decimations and destruction of the culture, and pretty much we talk about Congo religion as something from the past. And that uh, something that's been put forward by important scholar over the last 30, 30 years. It's not just in our history, in anthropology and, and history. And what I try to do is more like going through a series of uh, uh, blueprints that allow to kind of illustrate the way in which um, um, Congo people respond to their own tradition, despite the uh, uh, historical challenges and despite uh, difficult life. Um, 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 in in that particular context, uh, but the the first uh, image is kind of illustrate Mpungu, Mpungu and Sambi, Mpungu and Sambi and Mpungu Tulendo is the as far I know is the only Mpungu or Nkisi that have given the name of God, and as you can see on the left is uh, wrapping up with uh, um, particular organic material. And it starts with a small, uh, small nut, and then becomes something big over the life of the expert. And I just wanted to kind of show a different context uh, 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 of that particular Mpungu. And then the one image on the top, that you can see in the actual setting in in Angola, and it details that you can see the nut on the on the top. And the the second Mpungu. And I wanted to share with you is the Mpungu Ankama or, or many powers or 100 power. And is a Mpungu that use a, a, a mortar that used for prepare food. And that food also became a metaphor of uh, working with the medicine that being used for uh, religious purposes. And that's kind of crowned by these four cardinal point use particular plants, medicinal plants. And I have a, a figure of a, a woman's that kind of um, um, become the key that control the vitality that is in house in that particular object. Um, the third and kids and pungu or in kisi I presented to you is called Mpungu and Kodia, that is that use a fresh um, shell um, that to uh, also use for um, and Pungu and Kodia is in case that has a purpose to deal with issues of illness and it's more like a healthcare kit that 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 would be the kind of the functions if everything that has to do with malaria diabetes um, even COVID this is the Pungu that solve those the, those problems I know you can see the pack lock is the uh, that you use to activate to have a uh, interaction physical interaction with the uh, uh, with the uh, Mpungu to command uh, any kind of action that has to do through a series of procedure by um, um, touching those uh, opening and closing there. And the, the uh, Mpungu number four I wanted to share with you called Mpungu Kinyumba Mbumba. And it's, uh, it's uh, part of a four different sections in Mpungu that is made out of four different parts. And um, and this one had to be made in in equal versions, and and they had to be placed in the corner, the four corner of your house, and that kind of protect the the corner of your house. This is the one I have here, 
to protect my wife when I am traveling. So it's just a, a, but it is what the photograph after being made. And what you see in the middle is a um, skull from um, um, uh, baboons and have 21 pair of leaves that can be combined in a, and they kind of dry out. It has to be replaced over time. Um, but also, we cannot ignore the importance of writing in the Congo tradition. And this is just an example from Mpeve, a Longo church or guardian spirit that they use this ground drawing similar to the foundation drawing you will find in Revival in Jamaica or in, 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 um, in Trinidad. That, and they use cowlings to depict those uh, drawings and they have a second variations of these uh, drawings. They've been made out of organic material like flowers and, and plants that will be placing above that uh, drawings. And the, and the last one that kind of, two the points I wanted to make here is just two important elements in the Congo tradition. One is the actual materiality of religions through what we um, know through the council of Nkisi, what the Bakongo people in the Masa Congo, they call them Pungu. And Nkisi is a very specific object, different from an Mpungu. I want to explain that later if, if we have the time. And there's the second element I wanted to explain is the use of graphic writings as part of the tradition. It's something that uh, is important in the Congo tradition in places like Cuba uh, that Belia and I uh, um, come from. Just uh, finishing, the, um, this is a drawing from a ceremony that takes place every 50 years in Haiti. And I, I was traveling as part of the Getty uh, Pacific Standard grant. And uh, a friend of mine asked me to make these symbols of uh, depiction of uh, Simbi on the grounds that um, um, he couldn't remember uh, properly. And, um, and I kind of asked him for my help. And uh, this is uh, just an example. Um, and I just wanted to show the, the kind of on the left is the Congo tradition as we're speaking right now, and is the Congo tradition on the right that we know from the museum displays. And what being put forward as a tradition is already death, is something from the past. Kind of the images on the left kind of proved completely the opposite. Um, um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barbara. And, um, you know, the sort of living, you know, the living epistemologies, the living aesthetic is so important. And I might just uh, mention to our audience uh, that not only is this interesting and, uh, you know, compelling research, but it's even more so because, uh, the whole histories of conflict in Angola and the Democratic Republic of the Congo have meant that very little research, at least by outsiders, has been uh, undertaken for a very long time. And so some of the sense that certain people may have that, oh, those things aren't done anymore, uh, you know, could be just sort of taken to task by somebody putting their feet on the ground as Barbaro has done, and going and talking to people and in particular listening to people and them showing uh, the researcher what is important to them and all that sort of thing. So that uh, Barbaro's research just is absolutely landmark in quality because it really sort of brings us up to date from uh, earlier research that was done quite early in, uh, in the 20th century and not a whole lot has been done since then. So now let's uh, have our second guest, Jose Bedia, come in and uh, bring, uh, bring us some, some more great ideas here. Okay. Well, uh, thank you to invite me to this lecture. Um, I will to try to make a, um, a brief introduction of myself, but I'm always was uh, interested in the, in the approach of the African tradition. And as well as Barbara, I came from Cuba and I was initiating one of the Congo level and they named it uh, uh, Palo Briumba, Congo. And from the time of my initiation was in 1983, 
I spent several years before from 1976 to 1983 in the, in the process of to, to be ready to be initiated. After that, in around 1985, I was sent into Angola as a part of the Cuban army, like a, it's a sad episode of the history of my country, but I, no matter what I tried to do my best there, I tried to be in contact with the people. So for me, it was like a, some kind of level of graduation to be initiated in Cuba in this tradition and go back to the main motherland to have the main experience in the field. No matter it was, I was a soldier, I had many difficult to be interrelated with the community, but I, I do my best in that time. I, I will show you some pictures. And then from that point, we're going to move it through the, the, my uh, uh, PowerPoint to showing what I tried to do with that thing, what I learned, what I tried to, for me, it's very important to be in the field. This is the principal thing for me as an artist. Um, no matter this was coincidental because I, I cannot have a decision to say yes or no at that time. That was me in Angola during one of those caravans who going inside uh, Angola, leaving Luanda, going south to sending supply to the Cuban army in, in that time. So these are me there with uh, some friends in the truck and, and with some Muila women, mostly women. Uh, Muila women from Southern Angola. Those are kids with the toys. I tried to record every, every aspect of the Angolan culture where I was able to see around me. This is a Mary Muila, Muila woman with the, with the headdress who represents that she has more than a kid. You see this kind of arranging in the hair. This is very particular from the Muila. What? Okay. Those are all the women and girls. And these are the elder, uh, a couple of elder uh, Muila, the, the husband and the wife. And then I make a comparison with my own godfather in Cuba. That's, that is him on top. On top, uh, Alberto Wicochea and Father Cancer with his wife, Maria. And then he's sitting in front of his shrine, reading the oracle with the chills. And this is him once again on the bottom with, with his wife and his, his daughter. Right, okay. In the bottom right, yeah. So after that, I continued to with the idea to go back to Africa, but in a, in a different way. So in, in a nicer way, not like a soldier. I tried to be like a, like a visitor. And I spent a trip with Manuel Jordan in, in between Botswana and Zambia. This was in uh, 2004 with the Herero people in Botswana, Herero Bandero. And these are pictures what I take in the place and also sketches what I try to, to do. I, I like to emulate the old um, anthropology who they don't even have a camera. No matter if I take pictures in the, in the same time, I try to make my own sketches of the area. And I also collect many objects in, in the place. This is a Baye village in the middle of the Cabango River. And these are two Sangoma. Uh, one is a, a, a Butchman Masawa in the left, and the other one is a Umbukuch uh, Sangoma. From the, it's a group of people. The, the Umbukuch was originally from so, the southern part of Angola. And during the war, they started to move south, crossing the Caprivi region in Namibia and arriving in the Botswana territory. They, they, the elder ladies still have the, that particular kind of wigs, what is very common in there. And this is all in, in this uh, picture and drawing we are taking, was taken in Zambia with, during my visit there with my Manuel in the. Kabompo area in the Western province of Zambia. That is a, a, a healer with a, 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 a mutopa, the little figurine what he had. And this is the, another healer who read the oracle and he tried to explain me what the method what he used. And he had all the whole, his whole material displayed in front of him. He says, a Lubale, a Lubale man. And this is another uh, Chogwe uh, guy. We have the Chisa, uh, Yaki Sekula. Well, it's a basket to, to read the, the oracle, to read the future. So he checked the thing in the air. And depending on the position of the, of the little uh, figurine what is inside the basket, he make a, a, the interpretation of what the situation is all about. Those, are, those drawings are in reference of the Mukanda ceremony. It's a ceremony, it was a very important in, the, in this area. The ceremony of the ritual of passage, mostly for boys. They also have a Mukanda for girls, but the most important way for boys, when the kid was circumcised, and they and these are the I draw the whole process when the 
they make some kind of wooden chair to sit the, the kid in the, on the ground and to proceed to the, with the circumcision process and all the different terms, for, even for the food what he eat, bitumbo. And these are the, the Makichi who came right after the, the kid was circumcised. And they, they are representing different characters in order to, to be imitated by the kid or to be rejected by the kid. So they, they have good character and bad character. So the, the kid has to learn in, the, in this kind of um, teaching uh, visual lesson, which one is good, which, which one is bad. And so and they try to teach the role of the future men and future women in the, in the village. So they, they they try to teach the the correct behavior of the of the, of the in the group. There is a Malia in the center. We say elder of the group. There is another Monapo uh, dancer with a and Monapo means the beautiful lady. It's not exactly a beautiful one, but it's the, the desirable, the ideal wife what the kids supposed to looking for. This is a, a Simonda. Simonda is a, they make fun of their neighbor, the lossy people. That's why they have this long, kind of long face and it's producing some kind of, of, of a, a happy, um, humorous, hum, humorous uh, uh, attitude. And this is the Luteno, one of the aggressive characters. And this from here, I can show you now that what I do after I come back from the trip with the, taking my sketch and my picture, the experience, and even the object, what I call it in the field, I produce my own body of work in my studio. They're, they still they have more character here, the Mupala, the uh, Chikunsa. And this is the Wendumba character, the lion character here in the back with Charlie holding the mask. Uh, Chihongo, that is the chief, uh, Chinde, uh, the, import, the most important chief in the area where we went visit. And those are the paintings what I made after the experience. And many of the painting, what I, I use instead of the brush, I use my own hands. So I try to to be linked with the whole process of how they paint even the house, the the, the in the village. So I try to recreate all the aspects. Even that picture, the famous picture from Manuel, I use it in a in a, in a painting over, over down there. You will see the picture in reverse, and it's like the picture and the representation of the picture and, and the reflection of the of the main image on the water. The same here. So I, I like to incorporate sometimes all ethnographic uh, photography that I try to make like a, a different comment that I try to move in from those pictures from the static condition of the picture to the to the actual moment of the of the situation, like it produces some kind of dialogue or revenge of the image in the present. So this is the hunter. This is a poacher. This is the guy carrying with the rhino head. Go ahead, go ahead. Now this is a Chivin Dailunga hunting the elephant. He's one of the principal characters of the Chogwe tradition. It's a man confronting a wild animal using a gun. So for the Chogwe, the rifle was something very important because it's a technology who, pro, who permit the one man confronting a big animal. In the path to, to putting down an animal like that, they require like a hundred a warrior, but in that, in that with the rifle, the whole attitude changes. So it's a guy who produced a meal, a big protein uh, for, the, for the group. Those are um, recreations of the, of the Bushman painting where I saw in Solilo Hills in, in Botswana. The top. My, and the top, and, the, and my paint is on the bottom. The idea of the lion what is, uh, is also related with the royalty also in Africa, and in particular in the Chitofu village, they supposed to descend from the Lunda uh, chief in the area. So that, that's why they um, encouraged me to, to participate to painting one of the houses of the family. So I make a collaboration between me and Ben Frechitofu who is painting the other side of the house. So I try to pay respect to the family who attended me there. And this is a other group of pictures where um, I image what I do using all pictures from the from the colonial time in Africa. On the top, you can see the detail of the Italian soldier do the, during the campaign in Ethiopia, taking advantage of the women, the local women, they are far, they holding women from the breast. So I tried to make an ironic commentary in the bottom with the drawing, name it 
colonial paradise, and the guy looked like a skeleton in the middle. And this is the result of the, of the first trip in, in 2007. So I, I mix it up my own painting with the mask, what I call it in the field, with the family where I stay, the Chitofo family. Yeah, right. And this is one of the hunters where I met in the area. The, the, what I told you before, the, the hunter is a, is a very particular character in the Chogwe culture. It's a guy who represents the old, the old cultural hero of the group, Chivinde Ilunga, uh, the guy who came from the Luwa territory, the Luwa Kasai territory, and, and married the Luegi uh, uh, princess uh, in, in, the, in the Angolan side. Those are all the drawings uh, using the same image of the hunter where I met. Right. Right. Those are the and this is the installation what I made for the Birmingham Museum in 2000. The, the name of the installation is in, in, in Pangui Himawa. Himawa means in Taino language, twins brother, and in Pangui means brother. So I make a mixture between the Taino language from the Caribbean and the Congo tradition. And this is the installation what I made to pay respect for some kind of amazing tradition who was developed between the Cuban soldiers and Angola. In some particular moment of the year, they, every soldier had to produce a, a toy made by their own hand to give it to a kid. So, but because every man in that, every soldier was there was men, the only toy was related with the war. So I found this toy, go ahead, who was something who can be not specifically for boys, it can be also for girls, it's a couple of dogs. And I make as a whole idea about the, how this guy tried to re represent the ancestor in Africa and the ancestor in Africa you represent it always as a, a, a pristine like couple. So that this, uh, that's why I recreate that installation, pay respect for that um, initial uh, tradition while well, the Cuban soldier developed there in Angola in those years. And those are paintings where I try to recreate, recreate also the image of the Inkisi. I incorporate many of the cases, the picture of the main Inkisi, but mo many of those are at the Terbiran collection in Belgium. You can see it there, right beside the, 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 the head. And here too. So I tried to, to take that static image of the Nkisi and try to represent the, the alignment, the power of the thing uh, uh, sweating out. If we, we can say, suppose it's a, a sudar afuera. Okay. And this is, this is not part of the, um, of the same presentation, but I incorporate this because it's, yet show the, the last uh, trip where I uh, take in Africa between Mali and Burkina Faso. There is the, in the Do, Dogon village. There is the Senufo village in, the, in, in, in Burkina. That is once again the, in the Dogon country, in the, the Bandiagar escarpment with the hunter society there. And there is the, with the Wa people in, Bur, in Burkina. There is one of the, my relation with the local artists because I don't consider the people artesanos. For me, are the main artists. This one there is Adulaye, who is a, is an amazing character. And he's a, in the left, and the other one is a Mama Diarra. He's a Bozo artist who lives in the in Segu, beside the Niger River. And this is another part of the collaboration what I made with the. A, a communal uh, group of, of um, people in Bambara, people from Segu, who produce textile, uh, traditional textile. So I, I try to link my own process, my own art with the with the thing what they do there, and I claim in the paint the the canvas or the of the textile in the middle process. So I incorporate my own image in between. You will see the last one now. There is one of the. Let's see what I make from there. The end result. Yeah. yeah, this is it. Yeah. Well, Jose, uh, you saying this is it? Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> no, many it's... of us think about it. You know, honestly, um, your presentation following Barbaro's is just so compelling, and uh, I'm sure that we have lots and lots of. 
great thoughts and whatever. I might just uh, mention that, uh, you know, in my introduction, I alluded to the uh, exhibition that uh, Senor Bedia did with the Fowler. And if anyone is interested, uh, you can just sort of call that up uh, online. And there's a terrific four minute uh, YouTube of his creation of, a, of an in situ work in the Fowler Gallery. So what I'd like to do now is uh, ask our colleague, uh, Ellen Perlstein, to um, help with the questions and whatever, because I will just admit publicly that my uh, electronic abilities are not hers, and uh, I would have a difficult time doing this. So I will now ask Ellen to uh, help us out. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Al and Barbaro and Bedia. I mean, this has just been an amazing, amazing um, uh, group of images. And I, I think we, um, we, we also were kind of thinking along the lines of before we open it up to questions from our audience um, of having a sort of a conversation um, between all of you, uh, both of you, about, you know, I, I think the, the, the significant kinds of interpretation that, that both of you are able to do being A, doing this important field work, but also not being completely separated from what you're, what you're sort of participating in, but both having your own kind of involvement in the, the, communities with which you're working um, has made your interpretations that much richer. You know, there's a kind of embedded understanding that both of you are sharing with us that we kind of, when we did our class and we looked at these, these items in the Fowler Museum, there's no way that we could reach that level of understanding that both of you kind of evidenced. And I was wondering whether you have um, kind of any, any thoughts about that, 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 whole, that whole concept of the, the richness of your own involvement and how that assists in your understanding of these materials. Um. I can I can start, but maybe please, yeah, yeah please. I, I think in my my I sometimes I am more uh, restricted to to uh, give up information about my my personal my personal life uh, so in a way because in the, the kind of practice as a but someone who working as a professor is uh, a lot of scrutiny about. Um, um, you know who you are in your private life and the scholar who's supposed to be more rational in the own mm -hmm. but uh, i as very uh, i come from a, a family a, a religious family but my entire family um and i've been initiated for a long long time and the reason i came into that um i i was uh, the person you to the role you to be to to depict the drawings on the floor in the Congo tradition that I was initiated. But I, I kind of, I was doing everything in a kind of automatic way. I kind of remember the symbols and kind of translating, depicting right away in relation to whatever had to be uh, performed. So a request from my godfather or the priest. And um, and I think is my my research and my kind of my personal research is kind of try to I wanted to understand how you make meaning meanings in that tradition how you create meanings in that tradition that doesn't require this out, automatic process the, the remembrance and learnings that by memory and I think that that kind of my research uh, start from kind of interrogating from within in my own tradition but I I couldn't really go very far and I think the logic for me was to try to go back into the source that, that uh, kind of my first my first trip to my first trip to Angola was in 1986 as a soldier um, um, and um, but uh, 1999 I went back to do uh, field work and I was a student at Yale and I think it begins the the kind of unfolding the series of possibilities that were 
where this writing come from? What was the one question? The second one was uh, how this tradition, uh, what are the principles of that kind of uh, visual traditions and, and how you create meaning and how you learned in the end? That is pretty much what was kind of the beginning um, um, of my kind of transformations and desire to, to go to the, you know, to go to the next level into my research. Yeah, thank you. And I don't know, Jose, whether you yeah, to well, respond. Yes, uh, um, the whole thing in my case uh, came from the inconformity what I have uh, when I get in art school with the teaching of art teaching because the in in those years in Cuba and like in many other places the whole in, in, um, introduction of our art was focalized in Western tradition. So it's completely lack of other area that, that in like pre-Columbian or tribal in general, African or Asian, they don't show or they don't teach nothing like that. So I had to do this by myself. Yeah. I've been helping by uh, one teacher who do this for me beside the school. He said, I know you like this kind of thing. I go, I'm going to share with you certain material once in a while. And you have to return it to me. So eventually uh, that thing, that interesting grow more and more on me. And this uh, put me the position that I feel myself more and more involved with those cultures than the main Western uh, tradition what they try to teach me. And this, and in some way, this is the, the characteristic of my own work until now. So after that, when I tried to travel out of Cuba and I tried to visit museums looking for this particular kind of things, the other frustration was when I saw something completely mute and static or almost dead or frozen behind the, the glass. Mm. So for me, it was something, uh, I, I mean, it was amazing the, the, to be there for the first time to see that thing right straight from me. But I proposed to myself to uh, go when I have a chance to those places and see this thing in action. Because what we saw is just a fragment of the whole thing. A mess or a figuring or anything is, is just a portion of the whole cultural production you have to see those things in action so that i highly recommend it to people who like this kind of thing to go in the place yeah. and meet those culture because it's the only way you can reach the ultimate knowledge if we can say that i, I never going to reach something like that but you have to be there to understand what's going on and this is what i try to do with my my uh, trip and my field work and i and with all this material I came back and i feel that i am more sure that I'm in the direction where I go. So it's, it's some kind of tune. In Espanol, it's a sintonia. It's a tune where I try to put in my own, myself, in the same tune with those people. Mm. And we have a common point in between me and, and those communities. And this is what I try to, to do until now. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I know that we, you know, we're very museum kind of interested, you know, we have a community of, um, we have support, we're thinking about museums as well. Our course focused also on museums. So how does this, your embeddedness, your un, your incredible understanding, how, can, how does that get translated into the kind of activation that is can be achieved in a museum? What are your thoughts about this? Um, well, I, how can I say, I, I respect so much everything what is in museum. I mm -hmm. love it. And I, I think this, uh, this important part of the, it's not only the heritage of one group in particular, it's the, it's the mankind heritage. We are able to, to keep and preserve something who belong to all of us. Yeah. And for me, this is something very important because if we don't take care of that, eventually certain things going to be banished or disappearing with the year. So we are more than lucky to have what we have until now. But for me, the, the other level is to understand this because uh, if as an artist, I try to com compare myself with the work with somebody from the avant-garde uh, group of artists in Europe, in Europe do in the, in the early 20th century, the attitude is different. I, I mean, I compare myself with uh, uh, somebody like uh, Braco, Picasso, Modigliani, 
they like those things. They recognize the potential of the, uh, of the value of this art when they start to receive it in Europe in those years. But they only arrive in certain level. They get in the formal level, and they don't want, they don't go beyond that that point. They only was interested in the formal uh, quality because it's amazing formal quality that they have, and they transform the art of the of, of the of, of Europe in those years. But for me, it's something inconceivable how this guy don't take a chance <laughs> to go to the place. And this is what I tried to do. And now I'm going to go beyond the the the, the formal. A cap aesthetic capacity. Yeah. I try to go to the content, the main content of the thing. This is my, mm -hmm. uh, how we can say my, my characteristic as an artist. This is what I try to do, to go beyond that point. I am fascinated with the formal thing, but I also cannot leave apart the contents. The content are are, are strong, and those objects are alive it's still even now, even now. Though I respect so much this thing, and I love it. And for me, it's like a it's a living treasure, you know, it's, it's something where it's no matter you put it there or you live in the village or you use it every day, mm -hmm. the thing are alive. And they, they tell me something for, I mean, at least for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Bar Barbara, so Barbara, when I see that you continue to make an inkisi to protect your wife when you're traveling. No, I, me, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, I, no, it was so, uh, my, oh. my, my godfather, made it for me okay um to to um to secure to protect my family because he knew uh, you know I, I was i go to a place like people they don't like to go it's during civil war and so far uh, as betty was explaining before and uh, he said I, I think you need to you need to protect your family when yeah. you are traveling because i know you travel a lot and I, I think we had to do these four pieces i i had to also that that particular in case you require um you had to cut on your body and then you had to draw this uh, scarification that uh, is in 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 tune with the with the four pieces that had to be placed in the four cardinal point of your your home that secured the home and it's another uh, it's the the three pieces that come together they are very formally they are very different statically they are very different I just show one out of seven pieces that come together to secure my family. Uh, but no, I was so someone was uh, he explained how to do it, but I had to guide. I had to help him to gather um, all of the the plants, and because the and similar to the uh, tradition in Cuba, when when you build up the the medicine uh, called bilongo. In, in Kikongo today, and it's how you call in Cuba, when you, you had to get 21 pairs of, of plants of, of medicine, they are they had to be compatible. And, uh, and they didn't, they, they started teaching me that, you know, the compatibility between different plants and flowers and trees and how you combine and how you tie up together and how you organize them inside the, inside the pot. Um, um, that is, uh, and the skull is for the um, for the dream. It's the one that secure the dreams of the in the household in the household, and allow all you to see in the in the psyches a uh, consciousness of a member of a family from the distance. So, so how does that? Um, it's that's so vital, you know, and and so very much alive. Um, could had it would that translate to a museum the way a museum might choose to to represent the fact that this is this is a living uh you know a living uh a living tradition um would that well, not be appropriate would that be appropriate I think there are two questions. It's a living tradition is one thing. It's a living tradition Im imply this idea of a culture and particular way of viewing the world and habits and practices. But the 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 Mpungu itself is a living entity. There had yeah. to be there had to be every single ingredient in that made the the medicine as a whole it had to be replaced uh, from time to time. In yeah. the one, the, the mpungu and kama, the cloth and the animal uh, um, skin, they had to be replaced every three years. Uh, 
and that process the, of replacing and activating is like like rock paintings so you depicting one painting on top yeah. of the other one and then yeah. you have multiple layers of uh, and i think a museum I, the 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 words being uh, selected by you translating i think is appropriate because this is the only thing we can do we can mm -hmm. only translate uh, but we cannot recreate the entire conversation, the entire mm -hmm. procedure that define the nature of that object. And then the, my individual relationship with that object mm -hmm. implied a different kind of space, a different kind of engagement, a different type of audience also that, that will understand how this object is defined and, and change myself, uh, uh, change the person in the process. I think what we can do is is uh, is what someone explained in the, um one time always uh when someone is speaking in a particular language you had to uh, translate to uh, portuguese and they said to me no no you don't need to translate you just shift to mm -hmm. other language and i think there is a, a substantial difference between shifting in your mind into the entire universe and the logic of the language and then try to translate from Kikongo into Portuguese and Portuguese to Spanish and Spanish into English. You know, you have uh, degrees of separation between each of the language. When you get into the English, you pretty much lost 50% uh, uh, of uh, uh, the content. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions from our audience here and I'm gonna, and thank you to Deirdre for putting them all in a document for me. So I'm just going to start with these, um, these incredible questions. Um, he, he's interested to know if your Cuban military comrades in Angola utilized protective medicines during combat. Yes. <laughs> and did, did they join Palo and other Afro-Cuban religious yes. communities? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I that because I met many people well, we uh, we have to understand something. We in Cuba, the 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 government they uh, spread the idea that everybody is communist, so they are rational. They don't want any link with the past and with the religion, the awful religion past. But seeing secretly, that like, the people still practice those things, and more in situation like that, the uh, the a soldier who is a potentially dangerous in, in a foreign country. He had to carry with something. So I met at least three guys who have things there. And one, uh, one of the guys passing me one of the things what he has to me because he said, you know what, Jose, I, I live in Zoom and I see you need this more than me. So it's better you, if you keep it deep with you in this side. And I still have that thing. So it's, I saw many people who have those things there, but nobody talked openly like that because they feel ashamed because they can be accused of the Communist Party. Oh, you are a practitioner. You have to, you're not supposed to do this and that, or you're not supposed to use in that on you. But I saw people, for example, who have inside the hat a necklace of Orula necklace inside the hat, saw it inside internally inside the hat. So they're keeping that protection on top of the head. I saw that in particular one of the guys who go in the front line of the caravan with dogs, training dogs and those metal detectors to looking for lime mice. So he was more exposed than anybody else. So he needed extra protection. I met that guy who was a driver of the truck and he he had that little figuring and he had every time when he going to get in combat, the field have a little hole on the bottom and he put a screw on the bumper on the truck and he get in the battle with that thing. So he came alive and safe all the time so at the last moment, he said, you know, Jose, I know you like this thing and you respect the thing. Let me give you this to you. I don't need it anymore because I'm going back home now. Are you going to stay much longer than me? So this kind of thing that people, I, I hear all the occasion, a guy singing, an officer, not a regular, sorry, office singing. ¿Cómo se dice tarareando? Humming along or... Humming along like a, a tarareando, tarareando una canción like a, a whistling as, as a song. I, if the people don't know, you have to be inside the religion to immediately recognize the song and say, Camina chola, camina linda. Camina chola, camina linda. Camina chola, camina linda. is in reference of a female goddess or a female Mpungo from the Congo tradition. Chola, wenge, and wenge, chola. 
And when and I turned to him and said, hey, oh, you are in, you was initiated in Palo? So that song is the, about Chola Wenge. And he looked at me like, don't say nothing, you know? The, I always can have this kind of spirit. From the moment where you, you are already inside the thing, you start to find things and all kind of connection around. And some people talk more openly like others. So that guy was in particular reluctant to say, yeah, this is a song. I said, I catch him, you know, in some way because he's supposed to be offered. Supposed, he don't supposed to openly talk about religion like that. Yeah. Yeah, but I have many yeah. other examples of that, you know, and the... <laughs> And then um, also the Angolans have um, a, a, a tradition when we call the Cuban primos. We treat treat each other as primos, as cousins. Mm -hmm. And this is the, so we recognize mutually our, part of the, our tradition, especially the, what they call in Congo tradition came from Angola and arrived in Cuba. And also they recognize that we have certain connection with them. So they, we treat uh, treat this as cousin, primo, hey, primo that, primo this. And this is very uh, um, particular. And I also have, um, I received another thing from Angola, and but in that came from, from the uh, Angolan soldier. He gave me a, his protection bracelet to me and I still I have it. So they they have a whole kind of, of thing that, but it was openly like that, you know, the people don't talk about that openly like that. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go out of order here because I want to make sure that uh, some of the questions for Barbaro are also here. So there's many thanks for the presentations. I'll tell you many here. Um, but um, Professor Barbaro, your encounter with the perceptions and experiences of your research interlo interlocutors, what is their imagery of the diaspora? And how do they interact or reconnect, if they can, with diasporic forms of Congo culture? Yeah, that's a very interesting um, question. I think is the what I my approach to the the, the issues of uh, Congo experience, Congo um, way of doing something versus the diaspora. I try to see more in a conversation between these two traditions. And one of the things that happened to me, I I couldn't, when I, I arrived to the towns that was a um, um, rebel unit, it used to be, Sabimbi was a, a, I think a lot of people know about this person that used to be the head of the opposition uh, rebel uh, groups. It to be like five kilometers outside Mbansa Congo, and I landed in a military airplane to do my research in 1999. So that people thought I was crazy, and I took refuge in the in the Capuchin mission. But I, I have uh, with me one of the uh, Nkisi from from my family. And that's the only thing I can have. I I could have used to kind of present myself different from. I couldn't say I was a soldier in Angola in 1980. Six uh, to 1988, I couldn't. Uh, that they would kill me right away, and I used my American identity as a way to protect because I American used to be, you know, popular by the UNITA rebels. You might uh, know, and uh, I think the only way I can I I, I couldn't put forward uh, a research strategy was about sharing with me my own tradition, my own experience with them as a token of trust and generosity because it's a place that is very difficult up to today to get a, a trust and any piece of information from anyone uh, um, uh, about anything is almost impossible. And I think it's a, my, my plan was to build that trust by sharing part of me with them and vice versa. That was kind of the beginning of a conversation. But the, the other, in the other hand, uh, the, the Congo tradition in Cuba that, that, that became something that requires a series of procedure in which uh, blood plays an important role and the size of the object. That is a kind of assumptions over the time. Then I, I went last summer and is the ceremony they used uh, more animal sacrifice, more blood on displays like Tarantino movies. And, um, and that completely different from 
the kind of organic uh, simplicity that that I encounter during my my field work, and I kind of try to try to understand how you to be that tradition in uh, 19th century or during the condition of a slavery when uh, African people didn't have uh, the means to buy animals to sacrifice at large scale. And what is underlying the, the principles that allow to understand the traditions? And therefore, what I try to do is not try to compare the tradition. I try to understand the framework that in, in which um, they put in place to, uh, to explain and to practice a particular object. And I not try to compare a Ferrari. That is something I learned from Robert Faris Thompson. If you try to compare a Ferrari from 1920 in a 2021, then the, you won't even want to recognize it because they are very different. What you need to understand is what mean to have, what mean the concept of transportation and a car. And when you understand that basic question, so you will understand how this conversation that, that take place over time between these two traditions in different places. Because in the end, we people, the one that allow the tradition to be alive and connect and regenerate those, cha those changes from our own understanding. Well, um, you know, there, there, are, there are many questions. I've saved the ones that will be available for our students that we'll be meeting with immediately following. Um, and I think we're actually at time. So maybe what I'll do is share these questions um, and um, perhaps we can also figure out the email addresses of who's provided them so that we can um, allow our speakers to uh, further answer the questions that we haven't been able to get to. But um, I, I would like to so enormously thank um, both um, Barbaro and um, Jose Badia, both of you so very much for this amazing um, series of presentations and conversation. And I can see from, again, the comments in the chat and the, the kind of depth and complexity of the questions we've gotten, that this has been a really, really moving um, hour for all of us. So. Thank you so, so very much.